Okay, hello everyone, uh, welcome to Pony Racing. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to have four uh, participants trying to be the fastest one to solve the same uh, Ponyball challenge uh, while me okay. and, my, and my co uh, commentator um, Bob is uh, going to provide some commentary and guide you through what they're doing and uh, how it's going for them. Um, yeah, so we have uh, four participants. Um, first one is uh, Boris. So he is a former Codisec player, current Dragon Sector player, <coughs> played a lot of war games. He's 100% uh, uh, on Ponable.kr and found this uh, Docker Run C bug from last month together with Adam Ivanchuk. Uh, second uh, of our participants is uh, HPMV, who is a Silicon Valley guy who has been smashing some CTFs w uh, with Kainashi, including over the wire advanced CTF. A war game killer. Hasn't been going long, but is promising with really innovative, unintended methods in Pwn. Our third participant is Vlad uh, Vos Roscoe. He's a uh, captain of, or was captain of Elite More, and which turned into more smoked Elite Chicken, which turned into LCBC. Uh, who has won uh, a bunch of stuff in uh, nine years. Finally, we have uh, Matt Zapp. So Matt is a full-time student and at uh, RPI. He's currently finishing his, finishing his junior year and is an acting treasurer for RPI's CTF team, RPI Sec. Amazing. Um, can we get like a, a hello or something from our participants? Hey. hey. Hello. Hey. Amazing. <laughs> Uh, cool. So we are going to move you guys into the other channel and uh, uh, User was moved out of your channel. User was moved out of your channel. User was moved out of your channel. User was cool. moved out and of your Bob, channel. Cool. And Bob, you're with me here? Yep. Amazing. So um, I'm going to then provide the download link for the challenge. So let's s get this set up. So here we have the split screen for the players. And uh, let's see if I can just. Yeah, cool. Bring in the crowd. I'm just going to send this to them. Uh, don't uh, unpack it yet. OK, so I will post it to participants as well who are interested in, in, in kind of following along, like a sing along or karaoke thing um, okay so um, we I just want to see that everyone has like downloaded the uh, archive and is ready to go before we uh, get this started um, yeah, and uh, so we're going to just get everyone settled in and we'll do a, a countdown and um, as the players are starting up, we'll do a short introduction of um, of the challenge and what's going to happen today, uh, hopefully. Let's see if they have any, it seems they have some questions. Uh, I guess, can you, uh, is it working fine to download the RK? Okay, so just tell me. Yep. Uh, okay. It's just me, uh, you know, trying some, trying to get you to install crap on your computer. Uh, no, but so just tell me when everyone has it uh, downloaded and is ready to go, and we'll do a. Like a, a coordinated countdown and start. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sap, how's it going for you? You managed to download it? Yep.
Okay, uh, <coughs> Boris, HPMV, are you ready as well? Oh, yeah, yes. Okay, cool. So, Sap, I'm just waiting for you. Cool, <coughs> amazing. So, um, yeah, let's. Uh, I'm just gonna double check that the broadcast thing works as well. So you should be able to hear when I'm saying this. So did you guys hear that? Good. And <laughs> uh, yeah, I was. No, I'm broadcasting to this channel. Um, so if I'm I'm talking now, I'm in a different channel, and you should still hear me. Did you hear that sub? Okay. Oh yeah, you can disable. Uh, you can you can disable that notification. But we're not gonna do that very often. It's like we um, we're gonna release uh, we're gonna release a, a hint at uh, I think it's either after thirty or forty five minutes. I'm gonna double check that. Um, so yeah. Yep. Okay. So now I'm trying this broadcast feature again. Just making sure everything works good um, okay so uh, uh, okay Bob let's get ready then okay so uh, all the players we are starting this in three two one go yeah okay um, so Bob uh, would you like to just give a short introduction on what we're dealing with here. Cool. So Let's see what the players are, um, how they're starting out. Uh, so, is someone still downloading it? Or is was going for uh, Boris with the... Uh, yeah, okay, so he seems to have s some issues. Oh, we can't hear Bob. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Um, we're going to sort that out. Um, one second. Okay, uh, Bob, can you talk now? Yeah. Okay, okay so this should now it should be fixed. Yep. Should I explain it again? Yeah, so please uh, please give a short explanation of the um, of the challenge again. Right, so super simple binary, hardly any reverse engineering, shouldn't be able to track down the bug. It's fairly straightforward, but there's a little bit of a trick on the landing, which is that it will force them into x32 mode from a 64-bit binary, and then they'll have to figure it out from there. Cool. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's see how, where they are. So, of course, something we really need to look into is uh, SAP, who is uh, using uh, Jidra. Uh, oh. it's, uh, the yeah, happy Jidra week, everybody. So, uh, it's, uh, it, it, was a, it was a question beforehand. It's like, uh, who, is, who is going to dare to use the new, the new fresh uh, tool for this? Um, and, uh, yeah, apparently, at least one person dared so that's uh, that's good yeah um, let's see if it gives him an edge oh yeah. look at that yeah so just doing some uh, uh, s tracing on challenge or ah, okay so yeah let's let's just do a quick round and see uh, how they all um, So, seems like they have just started the initial uh, reversing uh, here, and uh, yeah, I guess it will take. It, it it's not really that much reversing to do in this challenge, right? Yeah, hardly any. Yeah. So, um, let's see if uh, you have any current commentary. Voss looks uh, 
a bit focused. Let's see. Yeah, he's definitely locked in. <laughs> It's interesting to see the disassembly in Ghidra when it comes to these short assembler only binaries. Yeah, let's uh a little bit of weirdness there. To, yeah, okay. So oh now it's too bad he's he has the, the VM um on top of his uh Ghidra setup, so uh we don't I didn't catch that. All right, checking perms. Yep. And yeah, fairly standard. I'm surprised no one's even started writing uh, exploits yet. It's really that quick. Like I was expecting that someone would start sort of getting in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I I very often do. I very quickly go into writing like a just a template script to do like automate interactions to just keep the right. amount of manual work at an absolute minimum exactly uh, okay, okay so we've started some actual dynamic uh, uh, analysis here from uh, Voss this is actually uh, at least doing the standard maze. yeah exactly I mean whenever in doubt <laughs> right And yeah, so some debugging going on from uh, HPMV as well. Uh, <laughs> nice to see one with a with a light uh, theme in their uh, GDB. So it's just stepping through, uh, right, to see what actually happens. Yeah, exactly. So. Basically, so the program asks for two things, right? It asks for a seed and just then, and then it's just a stack buffer overflow. Right, so the seed is making a fake stack canary or stack cookie, whatever you want to call them. Um, it's a really easy one, low entropy sort of thing. So it'll take the seed and the real time clock XOR with the least significant byte, and they have to bypass that. But obviously, they probably want to patch that out to do the actual exploitation part. Interesting, Voss is using Kira. Yeah, it's interesting. What What is this? Uh, I've actually never seen this. What is it? Kira is from Geohot uh, from back in 2014. It basically will just run the binary once and then you can sort of step to through it in a timeless manner. Very similar to RR, which is like a GDB thing these days, but Kira is the old one and it, it used to have a lot of really good tools. Geohot credits that tool for some of his success in those CTFs. Okay, so it's like a, what do we call it, like a time-traveling debugger or what you... Right, timeless debugger. But the thing is, is that it doesn't work out of the box and out of the box anymore, you know. But uh, it's still maintained by uh, Ned Williamson, I think, who's like obviously famous these days. Uh, but yeah, it's just great to see that. It just shows you that Voss comes from that old school CTF thing, that 2014 and before sort of era yeah it's really i mean it's really actually i mean it's i guess really interesting when we see these differences in in uh, technique yeah exactly yeah, of course and here oh, we look, have sap we also have google um sorry i didn't want to interrupt you but it's just interesting to see that there has been a few googles for red fq oh yeah so i mean that's it's not really something you encounter in your day-to-day -day work. Right. Yeah, not at all. It's, a, uh, it's basically a far jump, a, a far return. So it's going to pop the code segment off the, off the stack as well as the, the new uh, return address. So thus switching you into a different mode from 64-bit to 32-bit. Yeah, nice. And that means that, of course, the a lot of the instruction the instructions will be in, that the same bytes will can be interpreted as different things. Or exactly. Um, yeah. So yeah, here we have some actual scripting going on. So Boris is uh, starting to uh, set up um, some scripting. 
just making this uh, like template uh, pwn tools um, script that I like talked about uh, yeah, cool. previously. So so he's starting out with just sending eight null bytes as the seed, which is clever. Yeah. So obviously, under some runs, if the least significant byte is zero, then the the canary will be whatever you provide as the seed. So it's it's good strategy. But he can't predict the real time clock from the CPU. So I'm surprised that no one's tried to patch that out. Yeah. Because you can't really do the tricky stuff without, you know, with while you're brute forcing. It's just going to be too weird. There's about 12 bits of entropy you have to brute force, so... Yeah, but you have to, you have to brute force those online then as well. Yeah, yeah. 12 <laughs> bits, so it's, it's definitely doable over a network. Oh yeah, I, I uh, just said to the players that uh, we're going to release, um, uh, we have a hi hint to release after, did we say 30 or 45 minutes? If they... I think 45, yeah, but I, I think... mean, it's up to you. No, I think we'll say 45, I don't really know when we started, but um, um, yeah, we'll sort that out. Um, so, what we have then... Um, so, HPMV seems to be starting out some... Oh, he's doing this uh, classic thing of uh, just like creating like an input, like the, writing the payload to to a file. And right, great for GDB. Yeah, because then you can do just do run and then redirect the the file into the or the, the content of the file. Exactly. So what do you think? Is anyone popping out? Is uh, a better strategy? Mm, I think what's going to be interesting I is to see when they start. First of all, uh, they need to, of course, understand what the the RETF thing is doing, uh, right. and I think that's even something f decently experienced people might like not have fresh in their mind. Yeah. Um, and when they do that, it's they of course going to need to have start looking what what gadgets are available to them. Yeah, that's the tricky part. I yeah. think that yeah. that's really what's going to be the difference between success and failure here. Yeah. Uh, and that's where you uh, did a little bit of a tricky one on this challenge, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, got a little dirty for sure. Uh, so I s obviously have implanted the correct gadgets, uh, since it is just a pwn challenge, into the build ID of the, uh, there's obviously a, a share hash in, in the binary that uh, GCC builds. And so I've, it's in executable memory, so I've decided to stick a couple gadgets in there. Now what's interesting though, is that Ghidra will see them. The, it, Ghidra passes the program header quite well, and it's really visible. But in Ida, it's it's not as visible, so it'd be interesting to see. Cool. And of course, it's a 64-bit binary, but the gadgets are in 32-bit with a specific instruction that will only work in 32-bit. So if you're running it through some tools like um, Rob Gadget or something like that, it's not going to give you what you want. Not completely. Interesting. Yeah, so... And we haven't really seen any of the participants... Uh, like, I mean, when they start looking at the, the same bytes as 32-bit code, that's when you know that they have uh, some kind of uh, progress. Right. So... Oh, we have some... Some some kind of revelation here from from uh, uh, Voss. He has yeah, he has he, seen something. He's onto it. Let's see. If... Oh, he's launching Rob Gadget now to. Yep. 
So I'm just I'm, I, I turned on his uh, sound as well, so we see if he has any commentary on this. Um, oh no! So he's look, he is um, yeah forcing kind of forcing the architecture on the ROP gadget to f see what it has. Uh, and then you had the this is call there, for example, right? And right, it, it's it's going to see that. So what is he doing now? What is this tool? RP? Uh, what? Uh, oh yeah, that is interesting. I haven't seen this one before. Yeah, so, so what are the important gadgets here? It's the, the int uh, 80 thing, right? And uh... Right, so so here's the trick, right? Obviously, there's a 32-bit system call there, right? The software interrupts int 80. But right before that, there's a, a pivot gadget. And that's really what he needs to look for. Now, between the pivot gadget and the, the system call is a, a an instruction that will only work in x32 mode which is aaa so he basically needs to manually look at this point rob gadget ropper any of them they're not going to flag that up so if he wants to see the pivot gadget he's going to need to look manually so they will not flag it up even if you force the architecture because they think that the aaa instruction is a problem Ah, uh, wait. So there at the top, you, ha you see the AAA, yeah. but it's not showing you the pivot gadget before the AAA. Yeah. Oh, what? wait. No, there it is. Perfect. That's yeah. the exact gadget. What was this? What did he use? Uh, was it the RP tool? Or? Okay. Lovely. Uh, so, okay. He's definitely onto something. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, let's yeah, check, yeah. Let's check with the others. Um, so, Boris s still... Looking around at the reversing, um, you know, I, I guess he's trying to maybe find additional, you know, things. Right. The thing with Boris is he's extremely experienced and he's, he's just a pwn killer. So there's no point in trying to guess what's going on in his mind. <laughs> and I can't count him out until way after the end. So I, I have no idea what he's doing, to be honest, but I just know that whatever he does, it works. Okay, cool. So we get a comment here on YouTube that says it's RP++, so it's the tool. Oh, uh, right, from, okay, yes. From our dear teammate, Matthias. Oh, well, thank you for that. Which Matthias, the web Matthias or the pwn Matthias? The pwn Matthias. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Um, yeah, some debugging going on from SAP. Um, Exit. Uh -huh. So he has some commentary here right now, so let's see if he... Alright, this is fun. Okay, so... We need to pass that check somehow. Yeah, so he seems to be. We have a seed, so I'm guessing. Oh, he's figuring out he's the seed the seed stack canary th stuff right now. Sounds like he's he trying to figure out that how 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 that works. Yeah, that's it's just a bit of pain in the way, but um, yeah, there's nothing magic going on there. So let's check in with HPMV. Checking some. Uh, oh, he's checking the uh, uh, far jump uh, manuals. Perfect. Uh, this is what I had to do when I tested this challenge. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So maybe we can just like just explain that to to people who don't know. So basically a regular return instruction will just pop one element from the stack, which is the new instruction pointer. 
Right. But the ret F will pop two elements, and the first one will go into the CS register, and the second one uh, will be the instruction pointer. Uh, right. And the CS register so also controls if you are in 32 or 64 bit mode. Right, because there's segmentation on x86, so th that's the code segment register. Um, and that's what we're doing. We're forcing them into 32 bit mode with that. So if they want to come back and run some system call, they have to keep that in mind. So the idea is that they're probably going to have to go between 32 bit mode and 64 bit mode, back and forth as they set up whatever it is they're going to do. Yep. I'm really impressed by Voss's tool set. Yeah, that also also t thing that shows shows the experience, right? You right. you gather these uh, these bits and pieces that it has been useful in one at one time, and you know to keep it for for the future. And this is that future. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to to see Kira in two thousand nineteen is just showing you everything you need to know. And the fact that he used Rob Gadget and RP++ was perfect because obviously Rob Gadget fails, RP++ wins. It's cool. Um, I don't know. I, I think I would have to lean towards either Boris or Voss taking this one so far. It's just an early... Uh, oh yeah, so Boris uh, is uh, speaking of, he is now uh, running Rob Gadget on this. Yeah, but he's not forcing the, the architecture. Uh, well, it will find that int eighty anyway. Yeah. So if he looks manually, that that should be enough. Yep. But it definitely won't find everything that Voss got. Yeah. So. Yeah, he's looking at the uh, the other syscall, uh, like the ones that are already in there as part of the the regular instructions. Right. I mean, that is a common thing with these sorts of challenges, isn't it? That you can control RAX, but nothing else. And then you'll sort of jump back into this tiny binary and try to get something like a P-trace or, you know, something like that or an SROP. So he's still on that path. I'll tell you what, seeing Voss and Boris go head to head is, is pwn porn for me. <laughs> That's not the term I expected to hear, but, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, yeah, we have uh, quite some activity in the chat as well. well um, Andrew, there's quite a few people watching, it seems. Yeah. Um, Question: Why does nobody use anger? Oh, uh, I I don't think it really would help. Or yeah. would would anger hand? I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I, I mean, for for right, automatic so exploitation, you can use anger to a degree, but it's it's not that easy. And especially when you got weirdness, like jumping between know, thirty-two and sixty-four, I, I'm not sure it would uh, help at all. It might help uh, if if I saw a vulnerability somewhere deep in the call chain, and I said, "How do how do I get there?" But that's not the case this time. No, I mean the like the source code for this challenge is like what's like thirty lines of assembly. Yeah, it's tiny. Yeah, which expands into a two megabyte binary when it's built. But yeah, right, because we fiddle with the data section. <laughs> We have a comment here that someone really hates these tiny binary style challenges. Uh, I mean, I get where where you're coming from, right? But I think it's also a bit cool because you can, you know, um, have these small little tricks and you don't get lost in the, like, hugeness yeah, of I it. Yeah, I love them. Personally, I mean, I love these, you know, you got them on W3 Chels, you got them on Pwnable, it's just, it's a perfect sort of challenge just to test, you know, it's it's just too easy to hide a vulnerability uh, in something larger. So here it just, 
really like sort of distills it into nothing and it for a race format is perfect yeah no i think uh, as long as it's not too like esoteric right uh, it's a little esoteric this one yeah no uh, i don't know i thought it was on the line yeah but for example these where you have to like where you have a local challenge where you have to do strange stuff stuff with like u limit and uh Oh uh, yeah, and then the output becomes RAX or something, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen stuff like that. That's a little. Yeah. I mean, who remembers to use set R limit or something like that? But listen, I can't have a guy like Voss, you know, HPMV, Zap, and Boris step to a challenge, and it's something simple. Got to be a little, little trickiness. Yeah, some more comments from the stream that these binaries are like more focused and to the point, better for live stream. Yeah, so that's the thing. Like we're trying to do something that you can solve in like one to two hours while still being interesting. And it's not very easy to construct challenges like that. Right. And it's not very interesting to watch people reverse engineer as we found out last time. The the exploit part was good last time, but I just feel like we, we got lost in the weeds a little bit with reverse engineering. Yeah. I mean, just see Voss straight on to the exploitation part. That's that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. So here, um, HPMV is bringing out the uh, x86 uh, instruction reference. Uh, yeah, very clever. So, yeah, he's looking at... What's this? Rex instructions. What's interesting? It? I've never seen that. <clears throat> what is it? I don't know. I've seen it come up in gadgets and then I just sort of skip over it. You know, when you get those weird gadgets. Yep. Maybe he's onto something. This is exactly what I expected from HPMV, by the way. If there is an unintended solution, it's going <laughs> to be him that finds it. It would be <clears throat> pretty cool to find something unintended in such a small... Um... Yeah, absolutely. We did take some precautions, right? Like um, double-checking that there isn't any other useful gadgets in the... Uh, um... In the build ID. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. So... Looking again uh, at Sap's screen, um, I think <coughs> he is s a bit sidetracked. Yeah, I think that's exactly it, right. It looks like he is looking at the um, the br because there is like one branch, right? When you check the the, the canary, exactly. So it's like a linear flow and then one branch, and I yeah. think he is uh, a bit confused. I then I don't know if he's like trying to do some trickery there or circumvent that part or something. Um it's, uh... Yeah. He seems to be in the, the loop of the XOR a lot and it's just sort of it just kind of it shows you the difference in experience with a guy like Voss who goes straight for the end. Right, I have a little bit of an and then everyone else sort of starts at the beginning. Ah, there we go. Look at Voss. He's onto the adjust after edition gadget. I was just actually going to ask, uh, what is the AAA instruction anyway? Well, it's just, um, well, I don't, I mean, I didn't like jump into all of it, but it's basically going to take the, the LS nibble and that will remain from whatever was in that input. So whatever system call is in RAX, it's going to convert that to the least significant nibble. Uh, it's actually meant for something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I that happens to me all the time as well when I Google the Linux syscall thing because the, the other one has a higher uh, ranking on Google, but this one actually has the 32-bit stuff. So, yeah, 
Okay, he's he's uh, going strong with that. Um, yeah, so basically all he needs to figure out, okay, is that that system call, I mean, sorry, that instruction will be safe in 32-bit mode. So that means he can link the pivot gadget plus the system call. And as long as he uses the system call after that AAA instruction, whatever's left in EAX, um, as long as it's valid, he'll be fine. As long as it doesn't cause the system to crash. Yeah. And here we can see uh, SAP is uh, also setting up like a template uh, script. Okay. Yeah. Good to see. Uh, also starting off with uh, eight null bytes to send as the seed. Yep. Isn't it interesting how everybody's using own debug except Voss? Uh, yeah. So what is he using? Um, well, he's just purely on Kira and using sort of S trace or L trace. Oh, yeah. So I just think that's fascinating. Shows you a generational difference, I think. Yeah. Yeah, Voss is on the exact right path. And uh, it looks like Zach is catching up. Yeah, so it's good to have that uh, template script thing uh, in place. Minimize manual stuff that don't, right. you know, that just consumes time. Um, how oh, is... Yeah, one more thing. Yeah. The, um, the amount of data you need to put into the buffer in order to overflow the return address is will make rex too large to do anything really useful in 64-bit mode so you you can't do a, an s rop from that you can't do any of that stuff but in 32-bit mode is the perfect number so that's the idea that's what will keep them going back and forth between 32-bit i see -bit. i see yeah we had a <clears throat> question i think why the binary is two megabytes and it's because we have shifted the the data segment right to be out yeah, of out so of reach right so obviously you got data and bss and um usually you would just stick you know uh, uh, if there's an uninitialized value the binary will just expand that when it's loaded so it doesn't need to keep a bunch of zeros in this case we did a weird thing with alignments so it's just a bunch of zeros basically compress is fairly nice though so right so let's see if we have anything here from hpmv i enjoy i enjoy looking at this setup because it's a nice light <laughs> <laughs> It's not black black back background with green uh, text. That's uh... exactly. Oh, he's also looking for gadgets here, right? Yeah. Uh, but he has not found the pivot thing right uh, yet. Right. I mean, that's the thing. If you use these external tools and you don't use the exact tool that Voss used, that's going to show you everything then at best you just need to see that int 80 and go take a closer look manually. Yep. Yeah, because reasonably, if there is an int 80 instruction, there is something Why before it. Become... Right. And in this case, there's something after it. There's another return or yeah. far return at least. Yeah. It just shows you how we get blinded by our tools sometimes. Yeah, so I think yeah, Boris is now looking at these um, all these register values that are set in the the one three three seven. Right, he's thinking that there's something he can use those for. Yeah, I was. So any, he, he can only trash RAX. Just remember that. Yeah, that's the one he controls. Yeah, what were you gonna say? No, I was just gonna say I, I I thought the same thing. Like, is this a is this just like a a red herring, or like are these carefully chosen values, or is it just like one three three seven? Or, yeah, yeah, it's literally one three three seven. Yeah. I love that people give like more credit than they need to. So. 
so but again you have to watch for Boris he, he, he's another one of those that could find a, an unintended use for one of those gadgets yep so here we also have a question on, on, on from the chat like how you can have like 32-bit instructions in a 64-bit binary and so on is that and this is something I always bring up f to beginners is like like it's just data like it's all about the interpretation like right it might even be a valid uh, arm and or MIPS instruction as well yeah um, so yeah it's uh, it's very important to all to remember when dealing with these like low level things right and it i mean that's the concept behind rop in the first place yeah like i might find a return in the middle of you know a bit of text as long as it's executable who cares yeah so yeah more documentation from uh, hpmv reading about yeah. Uh, text is a bit too small on my screen, but yeah. So he's reading about the uh, Red F thing. Yeah, he's one of those guys that likes to go deep. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually kind of worried about what he's going to see <laughs> on one of these pages. <laughs> no, but this is the thing, right? It's um. So when you just read the documentation for RETF, it says that yeah you can it switches the segment or whatever. But if you don't know about how this thirty two and sixty four bit thing works, then it's not obvious like you don't obviously make the connection that that's how you can switch from a sixty four to thirty two bit. That's a good point. And the other thing is you know, you 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 probably don't have like the you know 23 hex or 33 hex burned into your brain so when you see that in the binary what does that mean yeah uh, i think um Let's see if i can get it to the uh... <laughs> so uh when i was looking at this like you you see that because in the code it's it's like manually pushing that value onto the stack and yeah. it's like what does this mean so i think if you don't know how this works by heart, I think it's probably easier to just like Google like ret f and uh, the value instead of checking the the manual specifically. I think you will end up on some you know blog about some example or some malware uh, analysis blog post or something where they actually explain like not what it is techn technically but how it how it's used. That's exactly right, and that shows that you've been playing a lot of CTFs because that's such a CTF player solution, and it would work, yeah. Yeah. So another thing, though, yeah, if if you just ran it dynamically through S trace, as Voss did at the beginning, you're gonna get a message through standard error that says you're now in 32-bit mode. Oh. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. But I didn't see that on his uh, screen, though. So, Yeah, it was a bit earlier. Okay. But cool. he, he saw that straight away. So this shows you that little bit of experience goes a long way. Yep. Uh, yeah, but that's cool because then you, I mean, then you obviously get on the right track immediately. Exactly. Uh, it's also refreshing to see such badasses who also have little gaps in their knowledge. And, and it really just shows you that persistence pays off and um, that you just need to learn on the fly. Yeah, totally. Um, so looking at uh, SAP here again. Um, yeah, he's investigating these uh, sys calls that are made. Yeah, good. Um, it's worth doing. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I, I, w I would say that he is, I mean, he's a, a little bit behind, but I mean, who of the players have really, I mean, it's only, currently, it's only 
boss, right, that has like properly figured out that oh now you see it like process PID runs in 32 bit right uh, mode. Exactly. Yeah, cool, and runs in 64 bit mode. Yeah, Voss is ahead of all of them. There's no doubt about that. He's he understands what he has to do. He he's seen the gadgets. I mean, he has everything he needs at this point. But it's still a little bit of trickery. And then of course he has that brute force to deal with. Yep. Uh, and there will be some juggling back and forth between uh, right 32 and 64 bits to properly exploit this. Right. Ideally, he'd probably have to at least do it, you know, once back and forth. Okay. So like. Uh, 64, 64 to 32, 32 bit. and then back and do it once more. Okay, cool. So looking here at Boris, he is staring at the disassembly. He is looking at this... Uh, uh, well, he has marked this line with the 23 hex, but he seems that he's looking further up. Um, so... Yeah. See, Boris, Boris is an interesting one because he's already played all these tiny pwn challenges on all the big war game sites. Yeah. So I think he's l currently looking at some secret combination of using those existing values. And yeah. then that has something to do with the uh, 23. Yeah. And the plan is that there shouldn't really be anything there to find. Uh, right. Not without at least bouncing back and forth. Yeah. Good to see Geinvel answering questions in the chat. Yeah, very, very nice. Thanks a lot, uh, Geinvel, that you're here and uh, doing and some, some... P4 guys as well. Yeah. Some big names in there. It's cool. Yeah, we have uh, 176 viewers right now. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. So I think, yeah, both uh, Boris and HPMV see it here. There are looking at pretty much the exact same thing uh, right now. Yeah, great minds thinking alike, huh? Yeah. Yeah, so I uh, also had a question here in chat, what's the goal? Uh, yeah, it's a, so that's something we should uh, explain again, like for people who are new. So um, regularly, uh, the typical setup when you have these uh, challenges is you get the binary, compiled binary without the source typically, you reverse it, you find a vulnerability, you develop an exploit, uh, and then you connect to a remote server where the same binary is running, and you use your exploit to get a shell on the server. Um, and this, in the usual case, you just have a text file with a flag, which you submit to uh, the scoring system. But in our case, uh, there is a, a binary which, which you execute with your username as an argument, and uh, uh, yeah, that will uh, do stuff. Yep. I just realized. Yeah, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Is this an oopsie moment? It's uh, it's a slight oopsie. It's not the game breaking. So I think. Um I think it's a good setup with that because then they have to get code execution, don't they? Yeah, exactly. I mean, in a setup like this, uh, I find it kind of hard to see how you would get like arbitrary file read without code execution. Yeah. But you can definitely imagine other ponables where getting arbitrary file read is much easier than getting full code execution. Yeah, agreed. So here we have Voss again looking at gadgets. It's always a fun activity, staring at a list of potential uh, instructions to execute. Yeah. Yeah, so we had a question here in the chat as well about how you can run 32-bit instructions in a 64-bit thing, which was also answered by Gimlet. But basic, basically, this is what this RETF thing is doing. So since you have that uh, hex uh, 23 value on the stack, the RETF will pop that into the CS register, which will switch from 64 to 32-bit mode. Right. 
And uh, if you didn't have that gadget, you could do it with a far jump, another type of uh, instruction, or you could just you know, s manually set the CES register. But now, as soon as you do that from 64-bit to 32-bit mode, you've got to remember any of those 64-bit um, values, like the stack, for example, the stack pointer, will be cut off to 32-bit. So you're trashing those values. Yeah. Any addresses that go outside of that. Okay, so Voss had some kind of uh, moment of clarity here. Uh, oh yeah. I I didn't really catch exactly what it was, but it's looking about uh, it's looking at protection things. So, yeah. Uh, we should be releasing a hint in two minutes, so we'll we'll see how the players uh, will react to that. Uh, that's going to be interesting. Um, Interestingly enough, Voss won't need that hint. So this is just for all the other guys. Oh, so we have a face Paul moment here from Voss that we just missed, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but uh, Sap is uh, doing some debugging again, uh, looking at. Uh, um, I don't quite. See. He's checking, uh, for example, the, the mapped, uh, the memory mappings. Uh, just where? good. Yeah. Because he's going to need to do that pivot. Yep. You see those, those the data section would be good in 32-bit mode. You can see it's a tiny little value. Yep. So... <laughs> he spent more time in GDB than he did in Ghidra. Yeah. Uh, no, here Boris is uh, forcing the uh, um, architecture in ROP gadget, so he's uh, forcing 32-bit mode, but as we saw before, it will still not find the correct gadget, right? Right, but Boris is one of those guys that if he sees that int 80, I think he's going to go look manually. Mm. Yeah, he should. But I mean, considering where he is at now and the hint we will be releasing in one minute, uh, he definitely should get it. So yeah, so I will be releasing that hint to them now. I'm just going to double check that my broadcasting is working. Okay, hello all the players. Uh, we are releasing a hint, uh, so listen up carefully. And uh, the hint is build ID. Good luck. See if we get any any reactions from them on stream. What's making me laugh? Yeah. So here's interesting. Um, Boris has, uh, he's now looking at, he's disassembling bytes like manually, it looks like. Yep. Exactly what I expected him to do. So he sees that CD80 in the build ID yeah. and he goes, what the fuck does the rest of this do? Comment from Ginville in the chat. Uh, hint, 10 out of 10 on how to confuse a player. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those <laughs> what the fuck hints. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. It's also really like when you when you see it moments, like when you see that gadget hidden in the, in the build ID. Yeah, exactly. And I'll tell you what, you know, you laugh now, but those build IDs have saved me more than once. Um. Just some random bytes in executable memory. You never know what's there. Yeah, so it's interesting. HPMV is then using a, also a, like manually disassembling bytes to to find things. How uh, do you do this, Zeta? How I do what? When you have to disassemble bytes manually, what's your method? Uh, I use uh, the disassm function in Pwn Tools. Right. Um, 
So uh, I heard you you prefer this uh, the command line tool, right? Yeah, I use Capstone or Keystone yep. to yeah. sort of go back and forth. Yeah. So I I do I mean I guess that's what Pwn Tools uses internally. So I just like doing everything from within Python. Yeah, it makes sense. And obviously, you know, that website that HMV HPMV was using. Yep. I think we've all ended up on there at some point. Oh yes. Oh yes. No, because I I, I think I, I I like to never you know copy paste these things so if i'm if i want to manually disassemble something from a binary i will not like okay. do a hex dump and copy stuff i will like do a python script open the file read the relevant bytes put them into the disassembly function like everything is scripted so yeah. that's more that efficient for sure well yeah i mean it's um it kind of depends like if it's if you know it's a one off then the quick and dirty command line tool or whatever is better but from experience it's never just a one off because you yeah. always have to go back and you know redo some things and then i prefer yeah, to just have it a good structure from the get go hpmv is onto this yeah Yeah, another question, these uh, bytes in the build ID is executable? Yeah, so they are part of the same uh, memory page, uh, right? Uh, right? Just in the beginning of the um, binary. Right, so all that stuff at the beginning of any ELF, like, uh, you know, the program header, and then in, in GCC builds, like the build ID, all of that stuff, it's all executable. So if you find something there, you can use it. Yeah. Not very likely you'll find something there, but it happens. Yeah. So SAP is back in uh, Kidra, and uh, ooh, lovely. <laughs> you like that, that Bob? Gets, yeah, I love, I love Kidra. Um. Now he should be able to turn that into code fairly easily. Yeah. So let's see. He's. Yeah, it's, you should just click. Uh, should just click disassemble right on this. Uh. So oh, I, I, I've I've just I've used Ghidra for like ten minutes, um, and uh, I I've not really familiarized myself with the the UI. Yeah, quite yeah, yet. because you own you own an IDA license. Just admit it. You're never going to bother with Ghidra. Well, I mean, I will because it's a good tool for when doing workshops and stuff with students. So uh, finally, we have something that you can give to uh, beginners and and uh, students and so on. Absolutely. And uh, which is actually, you know, which actually has a compiler that works. Yeah, I love Ghidra. I'm a fan. I don't care what you all say. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah. No, I mean, I, I think it's it's amazing. It's, uh, um, yeah. That that decompiler is so beautiful. To be able to open in like an NES ROM and, and see some C, yeah, it, it's beautiful. I'm just a little bit, um, um, I'm a bit worried how they will this will affect the ecosystem, right? Because I had like, I really like the Vector Thirty Five guys and. Uh, I have I had high hopes for for binary in India, so I I really hope that they. Um, I think there's still a place for them. I mean, they are the scriptable one, the most scriptable one. Yeah. And and their price point is pretty low. It's a tool that everybody loves, and people like the way that it looks as well. So, I don't think they're going anywhere. No, it's uh, yeah. I hope so too. Also, a lot of people just don't trust Ghidra. Yeah, though I don't really get that that angle. I honestly, the NSA is allowed to get root on my boxes whenever they want. Now they gave me a decompiler for six five zero two. That's uh, I I I can I can subscribe to that. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah. So, 
So, not instruction, then do that, then let that, and there we go. No. Uh, yeah, so there is um, something is in that. Uh, not that much progress yet. Uh. I think Voss is just trying to figure out his sort of overall strategy, but he has all the bits he needs. Yeah. I think HPMV definitely saw the gadget chain. I'm not sure if he's sure that he's going to take advantage of it yet. He seems to be doing some dynamic analysis. Yeah. So Boris seems to be going through the the bytes in the in the header. He has been doing some manual um, disassembly and looking at the manual for the AAA uh, instruction. Which is exactly what he should have been doing. So I, I would put him at second place right now. Yep. Um, what about Zap? Yeah, let's check. Uh, he is... Yeah, so he's now looking at the, the build ID. Um, so what he should be doing is... Uh, just, like, disassemble this. Yeah. Uh, is this the thing you talked about, like how the instruction is nicely split in in the middle there? In the yeah, middle. exactly. Because the anybody who does pwn, they see CDAT, it's game over. Yeah. So when you just sort of subtly split it, hopefully they didn't see it straight away. But obviously Voss saw it, but he didn't use either. Or maybe he did, I'm not sure. Yeah, so we have uh, Boris again googling the x86 AAA instruction. You have no idea how happy it makes me to see such badasses having to Google stuff for a challenge I made. But so wait, this instruction actually, in the context of this exploit, it's it doesn't really matter, right? Or well, it does a little bit because it modifies RAX, which is then going to run into, or EAX, sorry, which then you're going to end up in a 32-bit syscall. So you have to kind of know how it's going to modify EAX before it hits that syscall so you know what syscall is going to be run. And it also matters that you understand that if you touch this gadget in 64-bit mode, it's going to cause an exception. This, ga this instruction does not exist in x86 64 yep a lot of binary ninja fans in the chat it's a good tool yeah so i mean i guess the the, the primary um the primary effect of the aaa thing is that it's not a valid x64 instruction so it completely right. completely like trashes any analysis you're trying to do on that Exactly. And if you step in through GDB, it's going to say, you know, bad code, and you're going to go, ah, oh, shit. Yep. Uh, yeah. So, um, well, we can do a little bit of a, a recap here while the, while the players are figuring out the next step. So, uh, for anyone tuning in recently, what we're doing is we have four players trying the same pwnable challenge at the same time. Uh, while we are trying to guide you through uh, what they're doing and commenting on uh, their uh, methods and strategies, um, and trying to provide some entertainment and education here. Um, and we have slight progress from uh, most of the players. Um, I think they are, you know, somewhere halfway, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So now Voss is. Uh, uh, Googling SIG return. Yeah, which is exactly what you should be doing. Yeah, because that's how you set it up for the next step, right? Right. So the thing is, is he going to do that in 64-bit mode or 32-bit mode? He probably wants to, he's probably just Googling it so he can see what the frame looks like and then he can just change a few values. Yeah. So when I did this, uh, there was a problem. The input for a, a stack frame was slightly larger 
than the original buffer. And so I had to do it over two attempts. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how it gets around that. What's also interesting is he's exclusively looking at 32-bit mode. Yep. System calls. Yeah, and I think this is going to be a tricky one that you might need to actually go back to 64-bit mode. Uh, exactly. Um. Now, I'll tell you what's worrying to me. Everybody seems to be using one of these websites to look up system call numbers. Yeah. Is it what's what's that about? Can we have a nice little command line tool that dumps all of this? Uh, I mean, I use the website as well. <laughs> Everybody does, right? Yeah. I use the one on uh, w3chels.com/syscalls, so I get R M X eight six etc. Yeah. But it's just it's really worrying to me how everybody has a beautiful tool for everything except that. Yeah, what I also would like to have is, you know, a nice way to to work with all the constants, like uh, oh yeah, um, like protection flags or right. all of that stuff, because yeah, I always yeah, end up map. like googling Linux headers. Right, I I go one step even further. I I make a quick, you know, I compile a, a little C program with that in. Oh yeah. And just Prints F out. It's just so inefficient. Yeah. So so Vos is looking at an article about yeah C S like S ROP. So yeah. Um, so he's definitely on the right track. So let's check in with the others. Um, Boris back in in uh, Ida. Um, not exactly sure where he has, is at right now. Um, Doing some, so let's we can see here his uh, his exploit script. So uh, no, he switched away from it. <laughs> should should have ability to just freeze the frame. Uh, yeah, so. yeah. But there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, potential improvements to this uh, setup. But I think it's working uh, fairly well. Uh, action replay sound effects. Action replays definitely a uh, thing on the to do list. Um, I think it adds a lot that Voss is actually using uh, his picture-in-picture -picture, uh, webcam. Like all the uh, all the reactions from him, uh, they are they're gold. Uh, wow! So Lace is in the chat, and he's obviously a big pwn guy, you know, pwnable.tw, and he says you can check constagrep from pwn tools. Oh, that's a very uh, nice piece of advice. Right, some pwn master advice right there. Yep. Yeah, so Boris checking syscalls again on the same website, uh, yeah. <laughs> which we all love. Yep. So, yeah, I'm. I'm not. As I said, I'm not exactly sure uh, at which step he is at right now. Um, so. Um, because he he has kind of figured out the ret f thing slightly, or but he's he's still looking for the right gadgets, right? I think yeah, that was he the... he understands the ret f. I think he's just looking for the shortest possible method. Yeah. To to take advantage, and um. And I think he's going to be disappointed. <laughs> cool. So. Yeah, so here we can see that the HPMV is uh, still playing around with uh, ROP gadgets, which, unless we are mistaken, will not really give you enough information. Right. Is it, at best, he'll just figure out to look at the build ID, which was the hint. Yep. Uh. On the print okay. So yeah, we definitely have Voss in the lead. Boris is right behind him. Then I don't know. It's a throw up between HPMV and Zap at this point. Before I would have said HPMV had had an edge, but now I'm not so sure. Yeah. 
we should um, um, recognize the fact mm -hmm. that it's like 7.30 or something uh, for HPMV mm -hmm. in the morning. Yeah, really, really early. Uh, and uh, HPMV is a killer. Don't don't mistake his performance here. He, I've seen this guy smash some crazy stuff. Yeah, and he's pretty quick. Actually, all of these guys are killers. I mean, yeah, that's why they're here. And I've been, you know, I've got to say, I'm just amazed at the quality of people in the chat right now. You know, yeah, it's super fun to see like, you know, the whole I mean, community. Really high edge people. Which is speaking of community, we should pre we could uh, announce this oh, like yeah. community challenge uh, thing. So yeah. we have been thinking about how we could uh, develop this further. So uh, what we decided was that for the next episode, um, we will invite uh, three people. Uh, but then we will also we will launch um, uh, we will launch a community challenge, which is another uh, ponable. And basically, the first one to solve that challenge uh, will be uh, invited to the next uh, episode as well. Um, Absolutely. So it's a it's a fun way of getting a, a bit of a like a nice mix of people. Maybe there are some, you know, unknown talents out there that we haven't talked to yet. So exactly. I mean, I said maybe. I mean, of course there is. Uh, yeah. So, so if you're interested. Go check out the challenge tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. So we will be releasing it um, tomorrow at the same time as this was supposed to start. Uh, so uh, it will be released at 3 p.m. UTC uh, tomorrow um, on the website, so which is uh, pony.racing. Um, and you can you can click to the community challenge. So that's where we will release the challenge uh, tomorrow, uh, 3 p.m. UTC, and uh, the first one to solve it will be invited to uh, the next episode. Um, so that's uh, you should really do that, I think. Yeah, and it's a little poem. Another fun little poem by Bob here. Um, so, yeah. Looking forward to that. But now let's get back into what's what's actually going on. Um, so, <laughs> Voss looks like some frustration. Yeah, I mean, we we all know that feeling. Yeah. And then when you additionally you know that this is this is all being live streamed, some well, pressure. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. Pressure makes diamonds, though, as they say. Yeah, yeah. True, true. Uh, got a question here in the chat. Like, is there a finish line in this race? Is there some hard stop? Yes. Uh, when someone managed to exploit the challenge and uh, trigger the flag submission uh, thing, um, it will uh, it will end, and we will have uh, like a debriefing thing here. So, yeah, Boris is still looking at this uh, CB uh, instruction and the CD80. Um, not that f much further progress here. Yeah. Um, yeah, he thinks that he can get from here to the win. Mm, okay. Straight away. Yeah, but that will not, that will not work. Well, I hope not. <laughs> You never know with these guys. No, I mean, it would be cool to see something unexpected. Right. Um, so here, um, now uh, HPMV is also starting to, so not until now, he's starting to write some, uh, some exploitation script or some yeah. script. Yeah, so he's going to do some... Uh, Look, he's gonna loop over the code, and I think he will do some disassembly here. Yeah. Um, okay. Or, oh, okay, so he will actually just try. So he's just gonna try to. Uh, okay, so he's just scripting the disassembly. So just. Uh, 
So he's not, like, if you can see, he's starting a process, not actually the challenge, he's starting GDB with the challenge, and then he's just going to send uh, all the different uh, disassembly commands to uh, GDB. Interesting. Um, yeah, which he could have done with, like, the... Oh. The the GDB attach stuff in in uh, phone tools, right? But yeah, I wonder. I wonder if this is a little bit of inexperience showing up. Yeah, so There's some phone tools inexperience. Yep, I would think so because you could. I mean, you could do the disassemblies right, right in in phone tools. Like you don't have to call GDB and send instructions to GDB. Um, I mean, it, it goes to show you that it's really worth taking some time to go over those Pro Tools documents and source. Yeah, yeah, that's what I usually day. like. Whenever, whenever I have a, uh, um, you know, something that I want to do, I have a thought like, okay, I want to disassemble stuff, uh, and I, I have some kind of this collection of. So, I mean, Pro Tools is like a big collection of all kinds of bits and pieces. So we just like search the documentation for like disassembly and then we'll see what what features related to disassembly there is in in Pwn tools and otherwise you will go and look at other stuff um and that's where you find things like uh the const grep something which i hadn't uh, looked at so that's right pro tip from lays yeah which i'll definitely be using in future do you ever use the format string stuff in Pro Tools. Oh yes, all the time. Oh really? I can never bring myself to do it. Um, I mean, okay, it was quite a long time since I actually did some proper, some format string challenge or format string stuff. But still, it shows that you're, you're a Pro Tools fan. Yeah, so uh, Voss had some insight here about his, the syscall numbers, and he had made some mistakes. So he is uh, he is looking at this again, um, finding is he finding some new stuff? I think the the tricky part is what is the best strategy yeah once you figure out the whole 32 64 and you've got all that stuff down it, what is the best strategy you're going to s drop in 32 bit mode or you're going to s drop in 64 bit mode yeah so I, I think you have to map that out and the thing is time is is of the essence here so but it's worth taking a little bit of a think yeah Um, yeah, so people were asking in the chat about the link to the website again. So I just posted it in the in the chat where we'll be we will be posting the community challenge. Uh, and if you happen to be, uh, uh, you know, people with graphical skills, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, um, anyway, so yeah, boss staring at all these uh, gadgets, not really finding what he he wants. We can check back with uh, this um, GDB scripting with uh, HPMV. So it worked uh, with doing what it did, um, but is he finding? Yeah, so he's uh, now, now grappling through this, looking for things related to RSP. But this is the issue, right? Because he is looking at all this in the 64-bit hmm. yeah. mode, right? Yeah, that, that, that's not going to help him here. Uh, so he needs to disassemble the stuff as 32-bit. Uh, right. So... Yeah, so that's a bit of an issue for him. Uh, let's check with Sap. He's back in Ghidra. Uh, and.
and is this up in the oh this is actual code of the entry hey bob are you trashing your microphone what sorry no <laughs> no problem <laughs> i was looking at another tab yeah um cool so yeah i'm just really hoping for that breakthrough here so now yeah yeah i was still looking at all these gadgets yeah this is this is a bit unfortunate i think because he was so i mean he had it all that gadget that he he had thrown up within minutes yeah. was perfect yep and let's see here hpmv uh in pwn debug um not really making progress yet yeah so what what do they need to do um a lot of frustration i can see it yeah yeah this is uh well if you look at the exploit that i did at this point, what I was doing was pivoting to the data section. So I was expecting that Voss would be pivoting already. And then trying to read a ROP chain that would basically allow him to do the SROP later. Yep. But it looks, it looks like he's looking for some other gadget chain. Yep. And that's unfortunate. If we look here at um, uh, Sap again, he's uh, uh, oh, interesting. He has some kind of wait. What instruction is that? So he's stepping through his uh, exploit, copying, creating a breakpoint. So. Yeah, that's after the, the branch, right? With the um, the stack cookie. Right. Interesting that nobody bothered to patch that out. Yeah. That's, by the way, one area where I think uh, Binary Ninja is amazing. The fact that you can just like pull up a program, double click the line you want to edit, write whatever instructions you want and then save it like it's a like if it was a text document or whatever it's just it's so quick with patching stuff yeah that's beautiful would have it would definitely would have saved them a bunch of trouble this time yeah i think they even have like uh, you can like right click and convert to nop in an, on an instruction Perfect. and it will just add the correct number of nop instructions to um What do you think your tool chain would be like for for this sort of challenge? You think you'd go with binary ninja? Um, I mean, the reversing part is. I, I think I would be very heavy on the this dynamic analysis side. Uh, because, I mean, the reversing is so simple. It doesn't really matter. Like the reverse thing, you could probably even do like obby dump. Uh, yeah. Um, and then it would be a lot of pawn tools, I think. Trying to figure out, uh, you know, where to go. Yeah, I think I'd I'd be all the way on uh, Ghidra and pawn tools. Yeah. So what do you think? Should we? Uh, it, Maybe. Are you thinking about the hints? Yeah. 
Uh, it's a tough one because it's a shitty hint. Yeah. It's like, you know, I'm, I know you know what the hint is. So <laughs> yeah. if you want to give it, it's up to you. I'm just thinking like if you should... Um, so what you're looking for in the build ID is the pivot gadget, right? right? Yeah. To which will move the stack to the the data segment, right? Or right, so they can use the same stack in 64-bit and 32-bit mode, which yep. then opens up some options. Yep. So it's not going to help them solve it immediately. There's still some pain to come, yep. but it, it definitely would like get them over this bump. Yeah, so maybe we should just you know provide that yeah, as a hint. Yeah, it's up to you. So what, like the, there's a there's a pivot gadget in the in the build ID. Yeah, build ID, pivot, exclamation mark, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, like, get them to look at the build ID, please. Yeah. And, and use the word pivot. Yep. So, okay. Uh, well, let's do that right now, actually. Okay. Uh, hello, all players. Um, there's another hint coming up here, so listen carefully. Um, and the hint is that there's a pivot in the build ID. <laughs> Foss's face just makes me laugh whenever you give a hint. Yeah. <laughs> Your hints are wasted on him. Yep. So that means the other players can catch up. Yeah, exactly. Pony ain't easy. So did that actually help anyone? Do we see any like new progress from mm. is anyone suddenly know, changing like their behavior? Uh. So Voss is having some tooling problem. Right. Reinstalling. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's that's when Been you're on there. the right track, right? Yep, exactly. Um, some some uh, exploit code here from uh, uh, Boris. Um, he has at least, uh, you know, he's trying. He's starting to put in some actual addresses there. So he has this 400.137 uh, address. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I think that's the exact one that I use as well in my exploit. Yeah, I think that's what I saw from his, his tab. Now he changed it to 134. Okay, so he's, he's just uh, jumping to a little bit before that gadget. Yep. So that should be, isn't that the pivot? This should be the pivot, right? It's like, because one byte for, yeah, it should be 34 or, or 35, uh, should be the. Yeah, I think it is 34. Mm. Okay, so some progress, your hit might have worked. That's cool. Yep, yep, 34 is the pivot gadget. Yeah, that's cool. And then third. 37 would be the, the syscall directly. Yeah. Okay, so Boris, it looks like he has found the uh, the pivot uh, then. Um, what about uh, Vos? Uh, he is using some other address. It, he, okay, that's the read. I really like when people actually, you know, name the addresses and not just directly put some random number in a, in a pack instruction, a pack okay. function. Then never read my exploit code, please. <laughs> it's like I always put like all the all the addresses at the top as like constants, like uh, like pop reds. Yeah, something, exactly. Something, right, yeah. But it's just so dirty. Well, I mean, it's uh, then you can actually go back and read your exploit. Yeah, you can read it, but everything's sort of variable width. Just a tasting, I guess. Oh. Yeah. Okay, boss is definitely. Finding some juicy gadgets, I think. Yeah, he has the ESP pivot here. There it is. Okay, cool. He's got that. 
Um, so we have at least two people with that one. How is it? How is uh, SAP doing? Um, so, yeah. I think he's still he's still focusing on this uh, branch thing with the cookie. Uh, he hasn't really figured out the, uh, I think the the retf thing. So that's going to be that's an issue. Unfortunate. Yep. Yeah. And if we look at HPMV, um, seems to be deep into references. Oh, he has the he has the pivot address there as well, four hundred one thirty four. Uh, so we have three people who who, ha who have the pivot. Um, so that's interesting. Okay, so now we have ourselves a race. Yep. So, concretely, what do they uh, need to do now? They shift, they can now shift the stack into the data segment so that it can be reused between 32 and 64 bit mode. Uh, yeah. And then. Okay, so it, it's a little bit tricky, right? Because that canary yep. that they were trying to bypass, that will be the perfect place to stuff the return address from that gadget chain. Yeah, so That's where they want to stick something to switch back into 64-bit mode, the code segment, 33 hex, yep. and a return address. So they're going to want to set something up like the stack pivot the first time and then jump back into the main binary code in 64-bit mode. Because if they touch any of those syscalls outside of 64-bit uh, mode, it's gonna be an invalid instruction. Yeah. And then what they do after that, that's up to them. I basically set up an SROP twice and then, you know, pop to get pop yeah. the uh, shell. So Voss is uh, face palming and laughing. Uh, I didn't really see why, so trying to figure out here what what he's doing. So yeah, he he understands to use the canary. Yeah, I I didn't quite see that in his uh, exploit code. So what did he he put something in the in the canary? I think he said something to read. Yeah. So he's going to use that canary. I think to set up hmm right so it's going to jump back to read more data into the stack his new stack his pivoted stack yep oh nice some um, copy pasting of code we all love that okay he's yeah, actually, actually changing um <laughs> yeah so yeah that's... He's, he's on his way for sure cool so what does this uh, the so the the thing that you put into the to the stack canary thing you put in a uh, you input a seed in the beginning of the program, right? Right. And and, and it's combined and with the clock somehow, or yeah, we get the CPU clock, and then we XOR, which is populates two registers EAX, I mean RAX and RDX. Yep. We then XOR them together, and then we take the least significant byte and XOR that against their canary, their seed. And that becomes the stack canary. Okay. So that means that you have, uh, you know, one out of 256 times one out of 256 uh, odds of knowing what that value is going to be. Yeah. So we have some more. Uh, okay, so looking here at uh, HPMV, uh, looking at uh, interrupt uh, interrupt handling, uh, exception exception and interrupt handling uh, documentation, uh, which okay. is That's interesting. Yeah, I think it's probably wise to know about that because he's switching modes from sixty-four to thirty-two. Okay, um... But I don't know that that's going to help him. Yeah, interesting. Wow, some. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> A lot of funky yeah. colors. I'm going to make this first one some invalid instruction. So, like. Interesting to see Radara. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. Oh, so we have now three different uh, like disassembly suites okay. being used. Not a fan. I mean, I've no. used it for some a a a AVR stuff. Uh, right. Super weird, you know, architectures. It does perfectly, but every day. No, I mean it's. I, I mean, I think the it's the same reason I haven't, uh, you know, taken the time to learn like Vim uh, or something. It's like I don't really what want to. What did you just say? Wait, <laughs> did you just say that? Yeah, yeah. Oh my god. I I I, ed I edit my server configs with Nano. Don't <laughs> at me. <laughs> oh my god! What a revelation. <laughs> uh. You didn't even say Emacs or something. No, I mean, like, it, out, out of out of those two options, I would definitely go for Vim. But uh, I have, you know, wow. I, I'm a nano noob. Nano guy, wow. I didn't even know you guys had a little team. <laughs> well, it's, it's like, it's nothing you really admit. Or it's <laughs> yeah, exactly. You should be embarrassed. Yeah. It's okay. I'm not going to judge you. I know anymore. you. I know you are, but it's fine. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, HPMV is yeah looking there at the disassembly. Um, Playing with colors. Yeah. Don't do drugs, kids, and so on. See that? That that instruction. Is showing up as invalid yep. in Radara, yep. the, the AAA, because he's loaded it as 64-bit. Yeah. Very uh, interesting. So, I can't quite read his exploit code, but he has something going on there. Um. Mm, just looks like breakpoints set up for the overflow yeah yeah he understands that AAA is weird yep trying to you know or is that way he's AAA is like uh, Radara for like do stuff right uh, yes it's uh, it's like analysis uh, the third level I think of analysis it's like AAA okay. and AAA uh, that's interesting <laughs> I mean, it's just a coincidence, but... So let's check back with uh, uh, Voss. He's copy-pasting some payloads on the command line. Interesting. Voss is a beast. Yeah, so he's setting up the two different... Parts. I would. It would be li nice to see his whole. His whole uh, code. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not. Sure, exactly here what, what he's doing. Okay, that looked like he was definitely. No wait. Yeah, I think he's doing the setting up a rock chain, on the data section. That much I could see. Yeah, okay. So how would you do you do that? You you pivot the stack and then you call the read uh you use the read syscall to write stuff. Yeah, the 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 code sets up a read at some point and reads to the stack. So yep. you just jump back to that point in the code. Yep. And that looks exactly like what he's doing. So, 32-bit mode and then pivot back to read in 64-bit mode, which is what those 33 hex are there. Uh, it seems like he's got a little error there. It's not 22 hex, it's 23 hex. Yeah, so let's check in with the others. Um, Sap still... Um Uh, still haven't really um, 
figured out the red thing, I think. That that looks really uh, odd in the uh, the compiler, by the way. This view he has right now, with all these like syscall, syscall, syscall. Yeah, right. I noticed this in Ghidra that when it disassembles, just sort of you know very tiny little ASM things, it doesn't yep. fill out the syscalls, whereas Ida does. Um, and if it was x80 instead of saying syscall, it uses uh, SWI software interrupt. That's yeah. It's I believe that's mean about that. terminology you would use in like smaller systems, right? Yeah, exactly. You'd think they would fill out like a little comment next to the syscall. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of this, what is it, the uh, red deck uh, decompiler or oh, something yeah. that has like, a, it's basically like every other line is a comment stating, it's like when you see um, code from people who are studying programming, like their first, right. first programming course, but in a formal setting, like every other line is commented with what the line does. Yeah, because you teach them that you should comment all the time. Yeah. And meanwhile, professionals just get pissed off when they have to wade through all your comments. <laughs> yeah, it's like you can have you can have a. I mean, pro usually it's enough with like a one line of comment with a, with a block of code if it's something is unclear. But I mean, ideally, if you name your your functions and variables properly, you shouldn't need that much comment. Right. The code is the comments. Yeah. But I mean, of course, right. sometimes that doesn't work. Like, you need just like supplementary information. Like, this is an implementation of algorithm X based on, you know, this or whatever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, looking here at uh, HP MV, uh, he is—he has the Wikipedia page of the Elf uh, format. Uh, up so he's he's looking at the uh, the bytes in the header and stuff. I think. Yeah, we saw Boris doing something similar earlier. Yeah. Not I mean, there there might be something there. I can't discount it, but I don't think it's going to pay off. Yeah. Did you give this one a play? I not the not the full one, uh, like properly. Um, I was looking at it and trying things out, but I had to spend time with preparing the infrastructure for this. So, unfortunately, not. Um, it's just so interesting how these little things can be so tricky sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be. Um, it's going to be like ongoing work with this project to, you know, really find the the ideal level of this. Well, of course, also depends a lot um, on like the skill and experience of the players participating. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be the absolute, you know, top uh, trying super difficult challenges. It can be very nice to have like you know, mid and entry level stuff as well, as long as you have players that match the the challenge, right? Absolutely. I think I would rate this at maybe a two hundred and fifty point CTF challenge. I think you are underestimating this, but really, uh, wow. Yeah, I, I I would rate it a, a slightly higher. I mean, it's not like a five hundred thing, but. Uh, no, no. Uh, 300, 350, you know? Okay, wow. Uh, but yeah, so I was looking here at what Sap was doing. He's running through the debugger a bit. I don't, I, yeah, I think he's, you know, still looking for that ret f uh, thing to properly uh, work. Yeah, it's. It's so tricky, isn't it? Yeah. When you when you get focused on the wrong area of a pwn for too long, you start you, 
you start doubting yourself, you start looking for the easy out. Yeah. And uh and I think that might have happened here. Yeah. A lot of frustration, probably. It would be interesting to just mention, though, uh, the teams that these guys play for. So, obviously, you have uh, Boris, who is, you know, part of Dragon Sector. Yeah. Voss, who is part of LCBC. HPMV is in Kainashi, who's a newer team, but definitely smashing it. Won a few TTFs. And then Zap is part of RPI Sec, which is huge right now. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, they're, these are all members of uh, top CTF teams. Um, Absolutely. Which uh, I think it, it shows on, you know, what they've been doing. Like, this is not an easy challenge. So uh, it's like when we when we give these hints, for example, you you see them, you know, immediately, you know, grasping that. But now he's. He was back at 137 for one of the gadgets. So he's using that for the syscall then. The 137 yeah. address. Yeah, the 32 bit syscall. Yep. Another facepalm moment by uh, Voss. He's realized <laughs> something. I would like to have like a transcription of what's going through his head right now also hopefully is he able to speak on the stream yeah it just doesn't do it a lot i have uh, i have him uh, unmuted uh, here right now as well uh, this is another infrastructure thing we have to uh, figure out how to sync our views uh so yeah uh, Organizing this is uh, apart from me and Bob here in the commentary. I have our other teammate uh, Losh, who's uh, helping out with trying to spot what people are doing and providing me with you know, some some guidance, um, uh, which is really helpful. It's so much stuff on my screen right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we. Um, should take a look again at HPMV. Um, still not really. I mean, I can't see that he has figured out this pivot thing really. No, no. Which was strange. Like, like, didn't didn't he? Didn't he also write? That we said previously that three of the players had the pivot thing down. Yeah, I mean, he spotted it, for sure. It was in Radara, he definitely saw it, but uh, I think he was thrown off by the fact that Radara told him there was bad code. Yeah. Because he was using 64-bit mode, so that AAA instruction was messing him up. So he's yeah. fallen into one of my traps, unfortunately. <laughs> And yeah. it seems like he second-guessed himself. Yeah. Yeah, because in the uh, initial um, version of this, you didn't even have the the stack canary thing at all, right? Or yeah, that's right. Um, but the initial version was definitely trickier because you couldn't pivot to a the data section. I was trying to make it that you definitely couldn't do that. Oh yeah, that's why you in that one you put the. Um, you put the data section in a uh, in an address that was higher, right? And that was a bit tricky. I'm glad we didn't go with that one. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, here we have the split screen view of all the players going at it. Um, I'm still still waiting for that. Uh, moment when so they, they still need to do the brute forcing as well with which could that could really throw you off like if you expect there to be no brute forcing and just a clean uh exploit yeah you could exactly. you could think that there is something you have missed yeah so when they fail that canary check they just get pushed to an exit that's it yeah um 
and the brute force they would have to make you know a couple thousand attempts maybe on average yep so it's definitely gonna it's gonna screw up their thinking and it also might screw it up if two of them are neck and neck at the end because it might come down to some randomness oh yeah yeah that would be really interesting to see two people having you know a local exploit at the same time yeah exactly let's hope that server is fast yeah um yeah Yeah, I mean the next hint drop would would maybe be that like uh, slight slight brute force required. Yeah, yeah that would absolutely. also probably throw some of them completely off oh, the yeah. track. <laughs> uh, uh. At least there's no libsy. No, no, no. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty. Like well established that you can have like a slight amount of, of brute forcing in these challenges, as long as it's you know just a couple of thousands of ten thousand attempts or something. Right. I mean, I at mean, least it's it's not pwnable.kr and you have like five hundred ping to the server. Yeah, and a two-day <laughs> brute force. <laughs> yeah. I think the rule that we use in, in the CTFs that we do, uh, of of which one is coming up in April, obviously, you should probably talk about that later. Yeah. Um, it's 4,096 attempts maximum. Yep. That's sort of what we look for at brute force across the network. Yeah. Though, didn't you say that this was two bytes? Of, isn't that... That's, yeah. So that's so more than that. two independent events, right? You yeah. The... The least significant byte inside of RAX, then the least significant byte inside of RDX. And you need those two independent things to match up in this instance. So with that little bit of overlap, the fact that RAX doesn't vary as much as RDX, it basically ends up at about the same probability. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Oh yeah, so I, I was confused. I thought you said it was two full bytes, but it's like it's no. twelve twelve bits. Yeah, 12 yep. bits yep. of odds, but it, we only XOR with one byte. Yeah. We XOR twice. It's oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Cool. So, uh, as Bob mentioned, while, while we are, uh, you know, waiting for this breakthrough from the players, we can, uh, you know, try to, um, or not try to, but we can pitch this uh, CTF that we have uh, coming up. So, we, uh, um, our team, Hacking for Soju, together with a bunch of other uh, organizations, are organizing the Midnight Sun CTF this year as well. So we did it first time uh, last year. It was a huge uh, success. So uh, it will be returning this year with the qualifiers in April, uh, the 6th to 7th uh, of April. So that's uh, Saturday to Sunday, 24-hour uh, online qualifier and then there will be an on-site finals uh, here in uh, Stockholm in mid-June um, so there are two uh, classes so there's like a um, student class which is restricted to uh, students from the Baltic Sea uh, region and then we have an open class which is open for uh, everyone so the top seven teams I think uh, from each uh, class will uh, qualify uh, to the on-site uh, finals, which was uh, last year won by LCBC, actually. Uh, so we'll see if they can, you know, qualify and, and retain their title this year. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Yep, yeah. I think so too. We have some really um, cool ideas in the pipe. Yeah, yeah I was... Uh... I was quite impressed by some of the, the innovation. Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll, we will say no more, but uh, <laughs> you definitely want to qualify for the finals. Oh, apparently P4 is saying that there might be a conflict. Oh, with what competition says? 
S and H. Not sure. Yeah, there's just so many CTFs nowadays, so it's kind of difficult to spam and flags. Oh, that's the spam and hex. Uh, uh, damn. Oh, yeah, that's. Uh, yeah. That's, of course, very unfortunate. Um, and yeah, that, that uh, we have to look into that, of course. Uh, uh, but yeah, unless, you know, the, the plan is 6th to 7th of April. So, so we have some more frustration from uh, Voss. Trying to map out the frame here, it seems. Um. Yeah, so I think, I'm not sure, but I think he might be running into something I ran into, which is that the frame's going to get cut off, which normally should be fine, except it keeps trashing the data segments, etc., etc. All those extra flags, those segment flags. Yep. And that is what makes it tricky. Okay. He's going to need to split it into two parts. I see. It, 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 if he just looked at the uh, the register values, he's going to see that they're all trashed. Yeah. That's a three or something. That's interesting. Um, oh, we got the first thumbs down on our stream. Wow. Oh, yeah. Someone is not entertained. <laughs> Better step it up. <laughs> Someone asked, what's the name of the cartoon character at the beginning of the stream? That's from uh, Spy vs. Spy. Uh, it's an old uh, cartoon. It was on Mad Magazine, wasn't it? I think so. I also have a comment here in the chat that there is SROP tooling in Pwn Tools to make exploitation way easier. I mean, yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna help uh, with his issue right now, um, I, and I think he might have used it. I'm not sure. No, but it definitely is is a go to. It's one of those things that you want to use because who remembers what the the stack frame looks like, the the signal frame. Yeah. Yeah, that's some. I mean, th these are things I, I I've never used uh, SROP, so I'm not at all familiar with, like SIG return. I mean, I barely know what it is. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely. It, it's basically the equivalent of what happens when the kernel does a context switch, and yep. it just sort of restores all the registers, except this is from signals. Okay, so, so it's it's like the what do you call it pop all uh, yeah instruction yeah, same sort of right so but yeah. done through a syscall instead of a an actual instruction right okay yeah that makes sense um yeah let's check in with HPMV again. Uh, still looking through this with Radare. Um. Yeah, it's really unfortunate to see how Radare can't sort of show you both things side by side. Yeah. Weird choice of colors, though. Yeah, it's like really bright green on a white background it's a bit uh, a bit aggressive <laughs> but i mean oh yeah. lovely so he's using w3 chels slash syscalls to look up system calls oh yeah which is such a good one yeah because they have x86 x86 64 mips arm everything So trying to figure out 
what he is doing right now and you know what what where he is stuck in the in the process I think that the the pivot makes no sense to him yeah because that AAA as far as he's concerned that's bad code he's not thinking that it switches to 32 bit mode and that that's a valid instruction yeah so I think he's just well, now he's looking for around that that x80. Yeah, but the problem is that still he's he's in 64-bit mode, and that's not going to help him. Right. While if we go over to uh, Voss, he so he's now looking at the the cigarette uh, frame, setting it up. Um, yeah, he's so far ahead of everyone; it's 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 scary. Yeah, so it's interesting. Well, I'm gonna drop the the hint on slight brute forcing, um, and yeah, we can do it. That we've been we've been going on that for pretty much two hours now, uh, so we can do it actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. now it's also fun because it's actually not really relevant to where they are at right now anyway. So, um, yeah, we'll do see it. how that affects them. We should. I got a f feedback here that we should have the split screen view when we provide the the challenges so I'll do that uh, hello all participants uh, we're gonna drop uh, another slight hint so listen up carefully and the hint is that um, there is a slight brute forcing required <laughs> yeah so <laughs> Uh, yeah, lovely reaction from from Voss. Uh, yeah. But this might be enough to help uh, zap out. Yep, yep. So to maybe to get him to realize that, uh, let's check if this gives him any uh, new information to, you know, stop the focus on on the on the branching thing. Yeah. So he has. Whoa. Okay, I've been missing what he's been doing because he had some big payload thing there that, uh, yeah. It's unfortunate I didn't see what that was about. Yeah, so we had a <laughs> some <laughs> people uh, compliments to to Voss and uh, people he they think that they all should have cams. Yeah, I mean. I, I think it adds a personal touch. I mean, I don't want to, um, you know, force anyone because peop some people are not at all comfortable with that, uh, which I, I respect. I mean, yeah, but it's. I think it's cool when you when you use it. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's really nice to see those uh, you know, intense focus, the face palming, the yeah. Okay, so here Sap is doing. He has some kind of uh, very odd payload here. Yeah, that is a bit odd. <laughs> it looks like um, looks almost like a ASCII shell code thing. Yeah. Um. Interesting. Yeah, no, I um, I'm having a hard time uh, understanding exactly what is going on here uh, because I have no idea how he came up with this string. So I'm very confused. Yeah, I'm thinking it could be a way to, you know, see what. Oh yeah, wait, what is registers. is it the is it the cyclic pattern? Right, but yeah, a really weird one. Yeah, no, it is. It's and yeah, and people mention this in chat now as well. So yeah, it's a it's a the Bruin the Bruin Bruin. I mean, I can't pronounce that. Some Dutch. It's cyclic pattern. Yeah. <laughs> 
I try to be, you know, fancy and formal yeah. here. But yeah, it's the offset thing. Um, yeah, that's yeah, a very, exactly. very good technique. We could mention that. So when you're doing these like overflow things and you want to quickly calculate uh, like how much of like pre how much how big your prefix or whatever needs to be and like what values end up where you can use these uh, cyclic patterns uh, and there's for example uh, functions in in pwn tools so you generate this string you submit it to you send it uh, to your program and then you can take for example the value from some register or where whatever thing that gets affected and you put it back into another function and and it will tell you yeah, so this was at offset 44 from the start of your payload. Uh, yeah, also great to see which registers you can trash. Yeah, exactly. Like poor man's taint analysis. Yeah, yep. So you get which, which values you can affect and where in the payload they need to be. Okay, some, some frustration from SAP. Let's check in with the others again. Uh, Boris, uh, looking at stuff in IDA. Um, not really sure what he's hoping to find there, actually. Um, I think, I mean, at this stage, he, he should have like depleted the information that you get out from the actual disassembly. Uh, right. But again, I do think he's looking for that secret way to get a short return to something yep. that sets him up without yep. going into 32-bit mode. Yeah. And it would, of course, be awesome if it did, but, you know, doubt. Yeah, right. that's exactly it. And, um, yeah, so HPMV is... So he's now manually setting some register. He has some bin sh string also. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, so he's going to, yeah, he's planting that in the data section. He's going straight for exec ve yeah. with the srop, I think. And is this the thing that won't work then, or...? Yeah, I think he's going to have to do this, if, you know, bounce between 64 and 32 bit mode a couple more times. And now he's Googling for errors, which I guess uh, const grip would uh, allow me to see. Yep, that's. Uh... Yeah, but it's, it's interesting that, you know, he's. He feels that he is uh, uh, at a place where he can start messing about like how to actually get the shell execution uh, thing. So for my exploit, this first time that you pop into 32-bit mode and then you hit that, that int 80, yep. I just wanted something that didn't mess everything up. Yep. But he seems to be looking for something that does something valuable for him, mm. like maybe a read or something. Yep trying to kind of combine I mean you split it up into t two separate steps to just yeah and he's kind of trying to squish it together in a one shot thing or like a two shot thing basically yeah exactly which I, I'm doubtful of but you never know yeah cool oh Okay, let's uh, see here. Oh yeah, this is cool. If you look at SAP, he has this thing where, um, if you look at his uh, crash now, uh, you have this thing where the higher 32 bits has been uh, zeroed out um, from. Right. So this is the effect, right, of uh, when yeah. you do this uh, ret def. Right. So, I mean, it gets a little technical, but the reason is, so for example, have you ever done move AX? You know, when you move some value to AX, it doesn't completely trash the whole RAX register. It just takes the least significant byte. Yep. But if you ever do something, move some value to 
E A X, it'll completely trash the the whole R A X register. And the reason for that is to do with pipelining and compatibility. And so that's what's happening. As soon as you switch into 32-bit mode, it's yeah. going to trash anything above a certain register value. But it doesn't happen in 16-bit mode, which is an interesting thing. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting little detail. Um, Pipelining is a lot of weirdness there. Uh, it's been a center of attention the last, uh, what, what is it, like one and a half year, right? Right, Spectre and all that yeah. nonsense. Uh, that was a uh, very nice talk, by the way, from uh, CCC, um, where they did like a summary of all the all these variants, because and that was really useful to me, uh, because you know oh. you heard about these different like Spectre meltdown, etc. But I, I I didn't bother to you know dig deep into what's the difference between them, but then these guys made this talk where they basically it was like a you know catch-up guide to the last one and a half years of development on this topic so i was a you should really check that one out yeah definitely will and they had like a a little bit of like a you know role play thing with a uh dickens uh theme on it okay so anyway uh voss is doing something voss is so oh, right, I think I know what he's doing because I had the same problem. I think he's just trying to put a bunch of values there to see if the other segment registers at the bottom end of that of the SROP stack take effect, which they won't because I believe that what is happening is his SROP payload is being cut off at the end, and it's just so confusing to him how those values are ending up in those segment registers when every see you see there fs is three and gs is three yeah that's the problem so the trick here is he needs to do this twice he needs to write something to that data section and then overlap his ezra payload there yeah those threes are not coming from the stack and it's just confusing him. So he's sticking a bunch of values on the stack to see, you know, where those values are coming from. Look, he's looking for the threes and he doesn't see where they are. And this is the tricky part. But yeah. this is something he's definitely, basically, once he, can, he doesn't understand why, I think he's just going to go, fuck it, and then just try and read it twice. Yeah. So what's it's the reason for this? When, when you do the, the cigarette... Is that when it gets cut off? Or her? Yeah, so he, he, it's the read. The read is cutting his stuff off. And oh, okay. because he only has partial values there, mm -hmm. it's not going to stick zeros yep. where he wants them to be. Yep. It's So there you can see his FS is fine, and there it's not fine. And he's like, what the fuck? <laughs> and it's great to see this because I had the exact fucking moment. So if he gets over this little issue, though, he's got this. Yeah. I mean, this, it, it's weird, but it's definitely something you can overcome as long as he considers jumping back into 64-bit mode one more time. Yep. Yeah, I think that's the insight that no one really has uh, come to yet. Like, right. That you might need to jump back to 64-bit. And that might be the last hint if we drag it out to that point. Yep. I definitely underestimated this challenge.
Yeah, so uh, sorry, Bob. I was just you know doing some some setup things here. What well, you, you said that we could do that. Yeah, I think if we if this drags out uh, for a bit more, we should provide that as a hint. Like, uh, right. But I think Voss. I was just watching him. I think he's getting on top of it. Yep. Yep. He's trying to figure out how, why those registers are being trashed, and he's I think probably a minute or two away from figuring it out. Yeah. I remember when that, we did the. Oh, sorry, you were saying. No, go ahead. I was just saying like when we were doing the, the first episode and uh, and we were like, oh yeah, they got this, they figured it out, they know this now, they only need to figure this out, and then when we talked to them afterwards, and one of the guys, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly who it was, but looked through the stream afterwards, and he was like, oh man, you thought that I had to figure out, but I had no idea what I was doing. So oh, yeah, endeavor, he had everything right at the beginning. Yeah, we or I mean, yeah. he had it, but he didn't know it, and we thought he knew it. But he didn't. So yeah. absolutely. Um, this pawn game is unforgiving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Voss just wants to see if he can just get one run without having those registers trashed. Yeah. So he. So watch those FS and GS registers. That's all yeah. he's doing right now. Yeah. He's going very quickly back and forth. It's a bit tricky to follow here, so... Right. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, Bob, uh, a quick comment. You see that uh, uh, Lars is providing, like... Uh, um, highlights in the chat so if you want to keep an, an eye on that as well so um yeah okay so let's uh let's go through cycle through the okay we have a thumbs up from uh Voss again here so not only face palms and frustrations uh it's good but let's do let's do a round here and, and see where our players are at uh so starting with uh boris um still looking for the quick win yeah unfortunately it's not gonna work yep i mean he's literally thinking of like how can he not go into 32-bit mode or how can he at least only go in there once yep and then uh i guess next is zap yep so Sap is let's see if we can get some audio if this is saying anything. So now he's looking oh what's if you look at the, the disassembly there in his debugger, yeah this Rex W ret F. Right, so what? that was the same thing HPMV was looking at earlier, wasn't it? Yeah, I've never seen that. I've only seen the ret F. What's the Rex W part? I haven't seen that before. I don't know. I don't know actually. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No idea. Maybe someone in the chat has some uh, some insights on that topic. Uh, okay. So it's a prefix in 64-bit mode to specify GPRs and SSE registers. Okay. That's useless. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, move on then. So uh, Voss, who who we have been focusing uh, on a lot, he, yeah. I mean, he's he's definitely ahead. He's trying to figure out how this, uh, you know, SROP, the the frame setup is working, and this thing that it's cutting it off. Um, right. You know, so if it just so he's gets... either either gonna repair that right here as is so that he doesn't trash those registers mm. or he's going to need to read it in two goes yep so we'll see we'll, we'll see what happens um so finally we have uh hpmv um still he's looking for some he's looking at the different uh, gadgets related to the stack here you see that he has um Look, yeah, it looks like he's doing the same thing as Boris in in a certain way, except 
he's looking at 32-bit mode ones and also the return addresses I mean the uh, the return values of uh, system calls yeah so he, he's still sussing out what what he could possibly do yeah and small thing to notice that he uses this uh, all the syntax for the uh, file redirection where he writes the redirection first and then the command he's executing which is super unintuitive for me to read but it doesn't really yeah matter. i do it the other way around as well yeah, yeah. but i mean if, to me it makes more sense like you put the program and then an arrow and then the file as like the file goes into the program but you can just switch the order and it's the same thing uh as in like less than file and then the command uh just a small side note uh anyway we have some some uh questions here in the chat so first is like what ctf team so yeah um like there are people here from from all the different all kinds of different ctf teams as we said we have uh, boris from uh, dragon sector Voss from lcbc sap from rpi sec and hpmv from what's the name of the team again bob k nashi k nashi which is a, a a newer team but very good right yeah top top guys they yeah. won the over the wire ctf and hpmv won the square ctf by himself yeah really impressive stuff um and then someone is asking about so they have to switch to x86 to have the pivot gadget then what about the astro payload cut off i don't get that part well the read to the stack so you go some data is read to the stack in 64-bit mode then it returns and that switches you to 32-bit mode yep then you're going to go back to 64-bit mode you're going to do the pivot go back to 64-bit mode and you have to do another read but the srop cannot be read in the buffer overflow the amount of data that's read it's going to cut off oh yeah because you read a fixed amount of bytes and we have some really nice reactions from uh from Voss. I think Voss is going to hate me after this. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to send some uh, some Russian like KGB agents <laughs> on you. Great. That's all I need. Yeah. So it's important to realize that the the tricky part here is that the read obviously will set REX to <laughs> Voss is going crazy. The read system call will set rex to the amount of data read that is the value that you're going to run another system call with so in order to do the buffer overflow you're setting rex to something that's not a convenient value to get a system call for 64-bit mode if that makes sense yeah you know the the for example sig return in 64-bit mode is a low value whereas in 32-bit mode it's a high value so you want to read a lot of data, set it to a high value in order to do that SIG return. Yeah. Oh, oh, Voss has a local... If I'm reading his screen correctly, this is a local working exploit. A lot of okay, finger sweet. snapping. Yeah, he's in the zone right now. Yeah, and you saw how he brought out his some kind of like templates and stuff, which he had ready, which is also like you know good tooling really makes uh, a different difference yeah solid experience with this guy yep. so yeah i had a, another line of th thought but i lost it um oh yeah i was uh you know i was thinking about uh Hints, but now when I see that he might have a working local exploit, I don't think we really, really need any any of that. No. There's only so much you can hint here, anyway. No, I was it's just thinking about binary. something about like you know going there and back again, but uh, um, it's yeah, we 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 don't need that. So let's uh, while he's finalizing that, let's check again. With uh, Boris, for example, still looking at uh, some uh, syscall numbers. Uh, on a different website, interesting. Yeah. I on mean, a website. 
Oh, so Voss is running it. Okay, we 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 need to we need to get, go to his screen. He's running it uh, externally or like okay, remotely. Okay, he's brute forcing. Yep. He's ready. Yep. So okay. this this might be it. This is where L LCBC shines. Yeah. So, oh, he's <laughs> he's bringing it, bringing up another. He's doing it in oh, parallel. He's ready. Yeah. <laughs> That's very good. Yeah. I think it's this, not his first time at the races. No. So, yeah, let's do let's do a split screen check here to see, you know, how this is going to go down. Um yeah, I mean no one no one else is really it's really near. Uh and before he pops it, do you want to tell everybody about the community challenge just quickly one more time? Yeah, uh, totally. So I can do that now while we wait for his brute for anything. So we are, uh, for the next episode, which we will do in about a month, so somewhere in April, uh, we will uh, invite three players, but the fourth player will be chosen by the community challenge. So uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m. UTC, we will release uh, a Ponable challenge, um, you know, in the same style as this. And the first one to solve the challenge will be invited for the next uh, Pony Race uh, episode. Uh, which, uh, yeah, I think that's a really cool thing. So you can get some, you know, some completely unknown uh, Poners coming in and, you know, having a shot against these other people uh yeah so that's it. so really keep an eye out for that uh as i said we will be releasing it tomorrow at 3 p.m utc on the website uh which uh will be uh i will put it in the description of this video and spam it on on twitter as well um so you you won't miss that uh so if you think you could do better have a go yeah uh, and we, we we are releasing uh, all the challenges. So uh, all the challenges that has, has been part of this episode, we will be releasing, uh, putting it on the website. We're still, you know, all of this is very much like work in progress and, and a continuous development uh, thing. So, you know, we made some improvements for this episode compared to the test run last month. And we have a lot of other ideas in uh, in the pipe and if you have any any kind of um like feedback comments uh, whatever just like reach out to us either like to me on twitter or uh, we even have like a, uh, an email address now you can just uh, email like contact at at pony racing if you prefer that over uh, twitter for example uh, my dms are open so yeah so uh Vost is now running two Right, one is local, one is remote. He yeah. wants to see if he can bypass the canary. He hasn't seen that. He ran it without the canary problem. Now he knows he can just brute force that, but he hasn't seen that locally. When he got the shell, it wasn't with that. So he's just trying to run the remote one, just in case. And then he just wants to confirm that his exploit works, even with the canary. Yep. Side by side. And there it is. He got a little shell. So, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see. Yeah. I mean, it will, it will still take a couple of attempts to do the remote one. Uh, yeah. I just hope that he's not too unlucky. Uh, well, the best way to be less unlucky is to run a few versions at the same time, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> More brute force. So yeah. let's um, let's check in with. The, I think the server should handle it. By the way, so uh, yeah. Um, so what's this going on uh, over at HPMV's screen? Booting Elixir cross reference. Server. Right. This is look. a way to look at uh, the source code for the kernel. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So what he's looking at? Modify LDT. Okay, now we're deep into stuff I don't really know about. Yeah, descriptive tables and that sort of thing. He's giving me way too much credit right now. 
because yeah. he knows I like to do some kernel exploitation, but uh, that's definitely not useful. Yeah, cool. So checking in with uh, uh, Boris and uh, all right, this is interesting. So mm -hmm. it looks like he's going to try do a push to sixty four bit mode again. So sixty four thirty two and back to sixty four to do something, and that seems to be whatever he was thinking about this whole time. Yeah. But I typed OD instead of ID. Holy shit. <laughs> okay, so Holy that's... shit. <laughs> Octal dump, what the fuck? Oh. oh, so he was brute forcing. Uh, my, exploit wor bleh, my exploit works, yeah. Yeah, so he had a he had a typo in his brute forcing, so uh, it wouldn't work. Uh, that's unfortunate. Let's so, try multi-threaded. Oh, uh, he's so close. <laughs> yep. Well, well, we'll leave him with that. It would be very obvious if he solves it. Um, so, yeah, where were we? Looking at Boris here. Um, he is... So he's doing the going back. You can see that he's pushing the uh, thirty-three right to the stack. So right. So that's going back to uh, sixty-four. Yep. Uh, okay. So at least like he has that part uh, figured out then. Um, and uh, yeah, but I. <laughs> it's so interesting to see this though. To yeah. see where people get stuck, where they succeed. Because these are all killers. We need to put that out there. Yeah. Every one of these guys is a top CTF player. So it's just interesting to see that even the top guys still get stuck. Yeah. So Voss is doing his brute forcing. Uh, let's check in with HPMV again. Um, so he, he has this... He's starting to build up his uh, chain there. You can see the pivot gadget, or you could see it in his exploit. Um, um, yeah, what well, some graphical issues there? Um, yeah, so not exactly sure where he's. Oh, he, oh, yeah, he was looking at the LDT stuff, right? That was HPMV, right? Which is right. a complete off track thing, yeah. Uh, uh Oh yeah, this is what happens. Uh, you uh, get on. You, you can easily get sidetracked, go down like the wrong rabbit hole, and you know, be gone for hours in the worst case. But I mean, at least he's learning something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's definitely a thing. Um, so, looking here at SAP. Uh, he oh this is the like fun the the what do you call it graph view in Ghidra. Yep. So I can now <laughs> tell you that uh, Voss has now uh, left his chair, uh, <laughs> taking a break, letting wow, the. Wow, he must be confident in that brute force. Yep. It's going to be pretty fun if we see him succeed before he does. Um, oh, he he has a shell on his, oh, his brute force works. So, uh, oh, Voss, where are you? <laughs> this is oh, amazing. Wow. Hellman <laughs> is in the chat and Voss is nowhere to be seen with a shell. Yeah. Thank God I didn't put in. Yeah, he has, he, has two, he has two shells now. Oh, boy. Yeah. So we have a Gosh. comment from comment from Hellman that uh, he thinks it's too much uh, traps and tricks. Uh, I I mean maybe yeah. yeah yeah we we might you know tune it down a little bit. Um, I think 
uh, we'll see. Well, um, let's see when Voss gets back. Uh, meanwhile, we can <laughs> check the others. Um, so, looking at... Oh... Is there a timeout on the uh, connections? I don't know. It would be hilarious if he gets back and he saw that he... Or maybe he won't even notice if it times out and then continues the loop. Oh, wow. So it just disappears in the scroll back. And he just assumes the exploit's not working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There he oh, is. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, oh, here it comes. Yeah, so he oh, did boy. it. Congratulations. Well done, boss. Uh, that's <laughs> it's so cool. Yeah, I'm gonna bring the user the was moved to your channel. User was moved to your user channel. was moved to your channel. User was moved to your channel. So, uh, hello uh, everyone. Wow, it's hey. done. Congratulations, oh boss. My God. <laughs> Thank you. That was wow. rough. <laughs> okay, so for all the participants who were not, uh, I mean, for you who weren't looking at the stream, Voss started his brute force, went, I don't know, toilet or something, and the shell popped while he was away, and we yeah. were wondering, <laughs> will this time out before he gets back? <laughs> uh, amazing. Wow, congratulations. Epic. So, yeah, um, good game. So, um, awesome challenge. Oh well, it's uh, thanks to Bob. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, it was great to see you guys uh, get wrecked at some of the same parts I did. <laughs> oh, man. Wow, wow. So uh, maybe, um, Voss, if I stop the fireworks on the stream and we go to your screen, <laughs> and maybe you could just do. Uh, short explanation of uh, you know what okay. we're dealing with here. Oh, so you weren't showing my screen, right? I I was showing your screen while you I mean at times, but yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, we have right I, now. I, I I mean I mean after after the the submission. Mm. No, because no. Uh, if you look at the stream, oh. the whole stream got taken over by big fireworks. So okay, okay. So we missed that nice because little video I, display. Yeah, yeah, I like I had some nice nice gifts. Oh yeah, okay. Now we see stuff. <laughs> 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 okay, that's amazing. That's amazing. I don't know if this right. is gonna be in sync. You, you know what? Uh, if you do like this, you mute yourself here on on Teamspeak, okay, and then do uh, just like a short uh, run through of the you know the challenge. And I will put your audio from your stream on, uh, and we'll do it that way because then your voice will be in sync with yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me let me know when you're ready. Yeah. So just uh, yeah, now. Me, so you just know now you're, you're we're hearing you double. So just mute yourself on Teamspeak here, and then and do a run through. Alrighty. So, uh, Kali Alex asked me to to share a brief explanation, but I'm not sure how how brief it can be. And also my team speaks somehow beeps because I am uh, talking while my microphone is muted. Fuck, how do I, how do I turn the beeping off? Uh, settings, where can it be? Oh yeah, no, 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 no. Oh, I mean, we can't hear the beeping anyway, okay. so it's fine. Never mind. Yeah. Okay, but but I can, and <laughs> that drives me nuts. Yeah. Okay. Never. Never mind. Um. So. Where to start? Let's. Uh, let's. Let's take a look at the binary first. So. Uh, maybe I'll copy and paste it to the notepad. Uh, for it to be bigger so we have a uh, seed that we provide which gets XORed with some random value but only with a byte with a with a char and this random char uh, is being produced as XOR of two bytes of RDTSC so kind of random um, 
we don't know what the random value will be, but we can uh, brute force it to be like just zero, so our uh, seed uh, doesn't get doesn't get modified. Then our seed is uh, used as a stack cookie, and here here is the comparison. And if the stack cookie uh, was intact on the stack, we instead of uh, a simple return make a red f return far uh, so what does red do what does red do it just uh, like pops instruction pointer what does red far do it pops instruction pointer and pops code segment selector um, also the hex race doesn't show it but if we if we switch to asm it actually not only does the return far, uh, maybe my, my face uh, blocks it, it doesn't only return far, but also uh, puts 23 hex into the code selector. Um, this one makes the return far switch to actually from uh, x64 mode to x86, 32-bit mode. So uh, we uh, can overflow the return value, override the return value, and uh, but uh, when we when we return it, uh, to that uh, to that address, uh, we get switched to 32-bit mode. So um, let's let's walk down the rabbit hole, which is my exploit. I very much wonder if it's uh, like an intended way, or I took like. Uh, a thousand mile approach when uh, it was just walkable. So, um, first of all, I, 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 yeah, uh, I, I set the seed to some values, which I'll explain later, and uh, I jump in 32 bit mode uh, to this address 134. 134, if we look at it in um, in 32-bit IDA, 32-bit disassembly, because we get switched to 32-bit mode, features this thing. Move ESP EBX, SK adjust after something, addition, uh, syscall, and also, again, red far. So, it allows us to pivot the stack to EBX, does some stuff and again does red far. Red far reads from stack, so uh, we pivoted the stack and uh, use it to red far again. EBX holds um, holds our global buffer at uh, six oh 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 four zero four zero zero, I think, or or something. So it's the exact thing that we read the seed to read 8 bytes of seed to. Uh, it's convenient because we cannot read far uh, without modifying ESP because uh, our our 64 by 64-bit uh, RSP uh, is uh, longer than 4 bytes. It has uh, the upper key, um, the upper double word set uh, and uh, in 32-bit mode we can't use the upper uh, D word, so ESP doesn't uh, have any meaning in 32-bit. Uh, oh, f never mind. I I can't I can't explain it like uh, properly. Uh, anyway, I don't know actually if I'm like uh, being too detailed in my write-up, but uh, yes. Um, so via this uh, stack pivot and uh, the value the value that I uh, read into seed, which is four bytes of some new pointer to code and 33 which is the segment selector for returning to 64-bit mode so 23 is uh, switched to 32-bit mode 33 is switched to 64-bit mode uh, thanks to this value in my newly pivoted stack I jump to this address Switching to 64-bit mode, switching back. So, what's in this address? Uh, let's examine in 64-bit item. This address is 
uh, middle of the subroutine, which does just some read onto stack. Uh, so it allows me to again uh, get another read, uh, but uh, with the pivoted stack, which is six o o something. What do what do I read there? Um, so I read there instead of uh, using the stack pivot gadget that I used here, I use just a gadget uh, of red far. And uh, where do I read? I read to again uh, the read address. So I'm actually using two more times, like I'm looping two more times uh, over that read uh, read chunk in um, in the code. Why do I need it? Because uh, here I set up some uh, like some um, data I will need later, and again uh, loop over to read, and in the final read, I uh, read exactly that much bytes that the final sysread syscall returns returns ox77 why is that sysread returns 77 so that means eax equals to 77 uh, i will need it later because i used the syscall with the number 77 and you can see that I uh, that I jump uh, to 32-bit mode at address 137. At 137, there is an int 80 uh, without the stack pivot, without SK just blah blah blah. Uh, only the syscall. Uh, so I invoke the syscall 77. What is syscall 77? Let's uh, let's see in 32-bit Linux uh, syscall list. It's sysigreturn. Uh, syscall sigreturn is uh, remarkable that it allows to pop from the stack all the registers at once. So um, if I if I understand correctly, sysigreturn is used when you return from signal handler. And uh, like pop all the like the entire context, the entire uh, program context, uh, context uh, with uh, all the register values, the stack selector, or uh, segment selectors, and stuff. I need it because I I I want to uh, control multiple registers to do some ropping next, and. Uh, there, there are no, uh, there are um, not enough gadgets to uh, manipulate uh, the the needed registers in any other way. So um, here I construct the sig return structure. Uh, if I understand correctly, here here I have uh, like. Uh, wrote down what other what parts of uh, sig return structure g gets uh, get popped into what registers uh, and uh, I used the second read here like with uh, some structure which will be needed later I said because uh, 70 uh, OX 77 bytes uh, weren't enough for the full for the full uh, sig return structure, so I needed to um, like read later part of this structure first on the stack, and then uh, read the first uh, first part. Uh, like if this if this is a stack, uh, underscores are uninitialized values. So first on the previous read. I read something like this. I will need it all. And on this read, on the final read, I will read like this. This length is 
OX77, so I get EAX equals to 77, and I get the whole uh, part that I need on the stack. So, final jump. Uh, what do my, what does my uh, like register feng shui da, d uh, do? Uh, actually, <clears throat> it sets EAX to OX7D, uh, oh. which is SysM protect. So you must guess, uh, like, you must have guessed, like, I will just uh, allow execution of some memory. Um, of what memory? Of memory at address OX06000, uh, so that's the global memory that I control. Uh, that's the protection flags, read, write, execute. Uh, that's the length, uh, one page. Uh, that's... Um, oh, yeah, that's the new... That's the new... Fuck, maybe the new RIP or something? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the new uh, EIP. It's a new EIP. We are still in 32-bit uh, mode because... This one is the code segment selector. I made it 23, so I, I could uh, switch it to 64-bit mode, but uh, I just left it in 32-bit mode. Uh, this is the new EIP. It points to the to that region uh, because uh, it will be executable after my mProtect and uh, everything will be good. Oh, no. Uh, maybe I messed, messed something up. Maybe it's uh, not EIP, but... Uh, ESP, uh, that's more likely, uh, right? Yeah, it, it's uh, on the place of H's, it's ESP, yeah, it's it's stack, it's stack pointer, but uh, right after the mProtect, we, uh, we uh, get a return, return far, we return to this address in 32-bit mode, because here, uh, no, this value uh, lies at this address for EO. Uh, we get a red far, so we return to this address. So now execution flow gets to this address in 32 bit mode. And right after uh, that red F uh, data, I have the shellcode. I have the 32 bit shellcode which spawns BNSH. Um, so you can like see that if this one at, is at 4 EO, 4 bytes plus 4 bytes, so my shellcode is at 4E8, and I'm jumping there. Uh, that's all, that's all, so it, give, it, it gives me shell. Uh, I actually patched uh, the binary to be one shot, uh, like, um, for... To, to not, uh, like, be... To, to not need to uh, wait until the RDTSC random uh, matches. Uh, to 256 times uh, I just uh, patched out uh, patched out the uh, the instruction to be XOR XOR like RAX RAX instead of RAX RDX so my random is always zero and uh, on the patched binary it works all the time every time yep shell so yeah that's all <laughs> Sorry for confusing, like, <laughs> sorry for confusing story, but uh, you can imagine I'm, my brain is quite melting right now. So I'm unmuting okay. at TeamSpeak. Yeah. Very, very nice, uh, Vos. Thank you very much for that. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much it uh, for this episode, I think. Uh, thank you very much, everyone who participated and all the people who watched. Uh, again, reminding that tomorrow at 3 p.m. UTC, we will release the community challenge on the website. So have a look at that. Try it out. Uh, be the first one to solve it. And uh, yeah, submit your solution to uh, be invited to the next episode of uh, Pony Racing, which will take place somewhere in uh, April. So since we're hosting the Midnight Sun uh qualifiers it will not be uh, exactly one month from now but somewhere later in in april but uh, we will announce the dates uh, here on youtube and on twitter and and so on and as i said before if you have any uh, comments feedback uh, anything like that just uh, reach out to me and tell us what you think 
and uh, yeah so just a final thanks to uh, my co-commentator Bob and teammate Lars has been uh, helping out in the backgrounds and all the participants Boris, HPMV, Voss and Sap uh, thanks a lot for participating and I hope you you know uh, subscribe here and tune in for the next episode in uh, a couple of weeks and uh, here's some uh, advertisement from Voss yeah so that's it. Thank you and uh, have a nice day.